Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, GS1 Data Matrix Code for industri Industries and Standards. My name is Rod Bolt. I am the Barco Channel Manager at Toshiba. Uh, today, I'm going to be taking you through four different points. So what is the Data Matrix uh, Code? Two, the industries and how it's used. Three, implementation from a hardware and software side. And also four, more information, where to find it. So number one, where, what is the data matrix code? So the code, the background before it was GS1 data matrix, and then also the GS1 data matrix standard implementation. So the data matrix was invented in 1994 by the US, by a US company called International Data Matrix Inc, or ID Matrix. Data matrix codes are usually square or sometimes rectangular in shape and are made up of multiple light and dark square dots or cells arranged in a grid or matrix. The number of rows and columns within a data matrix increases with the amount of information stored in the code. This is limited to 2,335 alphanumeric characters. And a data matrix uses the ASCII character table. There is an L-shaped finder pattern to help scanners to locate the upright uh, position of the barcode and also allow for 360 degree scanning. And the data matrix e EC200 is a newer version of the code that uses Reed Solomon codes for error and erasure recovery. So this allows for up to 30% damage, assuming the data matrix can still be accurately located. This ver version can be recognized by the clear corner in the upper right. The older version used CRC or cyclic redundancy checks for error correction. So people see a lot of uh, um, 2D barcodes. They see data matrix codes and they see QR codes. A lot of um, a lot of healthcare and supermarket uh, codes in our data matrix. We go to the cinemas and see a poster and visit a website. We see a QR code. So what is the difference? So data matrix and QR codes are both 2D codes. They can both carry a lot of information, all very much the same information in their standard. They both also have GS1 standards as well as regular. So they both can also handle a lot of the same GS1 information. So both both codes can be used to store information, including you know an item's expiry date, you know serial numbers, batch lot numbers, even your URLs. You know, you know, they can extend product packaging information. They can direct consumers to a website. They can have allergen information, lifestyle suitability, recipe information, usage instructions, et cetera, all built into one code. So both codes have error cap correction capabilities. This means that unlike a standard 1D code, so our old 13-digit code we've seen on most retail packages, the data can still be read even if the code is partially removed or damaged. Error correction capabilities for both codes is achieved by using Reed Solomon error correction algorithms. So it's a mathematical error correction method that adds data back up into a code. QR codes offer levels of error correction, and this will sort of increase the size of the code when the level is increased. Data matrix codes uh, sort of are set to, you know, one, one sort of range of data correction. So they can also be physically smaller than QR codes. They offer higher density, data density in, you know, in very small sizes, making them data matrix codes, just more ideal solution for marking small individual products and parts. You know, where space might be more limited. QR codes are larger and can contain more data than data matrix codes. So data matrix codes are only capable of encoding information in numeric and alphanumeric ca uh, characters. So because QR codes were invented in Japan, uh, they can also include kanji codes. So other, other than, you know, multi-byte character sets, making them suitable for use in, usage in non-European language countries. So firstly, GS1, what, who are they? So GS1 are a governing body of barcodes worldwide. So they're a non-for-profit company that maintains and implements industry standards and guidelines. So they took on the uh, GS1 data matrix code uh, a handful of years ago. Um, and they created the GS1 data matrix barcode. So it's an ISO IEC or International Organization for Standards and International Etro Electrotechnical Commission. So I think we'll just stick with ISO IEC. It's a recognized standard version of an in-house data matrix code, which I talked about before. And it uses the ISO IEC 15418 
2016. So it's a standards and it's an ECC 200 error correction standard to create just something different to the similar 1D uh, shipper codes we've seen in the past now, GS1128 and or even the in-house data matrix. So similar to your regular GS1 1D shipper code that utilizes function characters, so application identifiers, the GS1 data matrix brings the same functionality in 2D codes. So it allows them to be used in all sorts of different environments from retail transport logistics, track and traceability, but unlike your standard data matrix where you can put in whatever you want within the barcode specifications, GS1 data matrix codes have a whole gambit of guidelines you must follow to, to use this standard. So this is the size of the GS1 data matrix. It's just dependent on the following factors. So here's to do with the specifications. So the amount and format, numerical or alphanumerical of the encoded information. So numbers and characters are encoded in terms of bits represented by light dots or modules of an identical size. The larger the number of bits required, the larger the symbol will be. The size of the X dimension. So the X dimension is the width in thousands of an inch of the narrowest element on any barcode. So if you've got even a 1D, it's the narrowest line. With, uh, a, with a data matrix, it's the smallest dot. So what is the, narr what is the narrowest width? That is your X dimension. So the choice of form, whether you choose square or rectangle. In a square form, the data matrix code can handle up to 2,335 alphanumeric characters as per previously stated. But also remember with anything GS1, uh, with anything GS1 as an application identifier or a function code, that means that you actually have 2,334 alphanumeric characters. You can, if you're only doing numeric, you can do 3,116 numeric characters as well, but you have a lot more restrictions on that. So let's just stick with 2,334. If you fill that many, you've got a lot of information. So then if you've got uh, re rectangular, if you go rectangular, you can actually encode up to 71 alphanumeric characters or 96 numbers. But just remember, we talked about that function character at the start. So you do remove one character from the start of it for that function character. So then there are sizing charts available on the GS1 website, which also includes what's known as a quiet zone. So this is a blank margin. Uh, in a 1D code, it used to be a blank margin on the left and right hand side. Uh, in a 2D, it's actually a surrounding. So you need to have a certain amount of quiet zone. This is just to tell a barcode scanner where the symbol starts and stops and it doesn't confuse with other print. So the purpose of the quiet zone is just to prevent the scanner from picking up information that does not pertain to this barcode. So I've mentioned function one characters previously or FNC1. This is the control character that separates each application identifier in, in the GS1 barcodes. The sort of you know start and stop character applicant you know application application identifiers are prefixes given to define the meaning and format of of data attributes in gs1 barcode so in this barcode you see here you've got the o1 it's a global trading item number so a gtin it's a two character plus 14 characters the 14th being the chip digit of course which is your product code 17 as we can see here is an expiration date. It's year, year, month, month, day, day. 10 is a batch or lot number and can be often numeric. And also function one characters is not needed here because it also uses letters and numbers effectively. So if if you use any alpha, it instantly changes the uh, the type of code that it is automatically. So you don't need that function one character. You just put in the application identifier and it automatically detects that there's a function character being that you're using letters. So creative, yeah, effectively creates its own function character. And then there's uh, 21 serial number. So anything up to 20 characters in that. So all these areas make the difference between a standard in-house, standard in-house use data matrix and also the GS1 data matrix. But you can fit so much more information to this, uh, not just what you see here, and which allows for consumers to have more visibility about what's in their product. So industries, where's this used? How's it used? So if we're talking about you know retail, retail is just taking this off with a huge bang. You know, 
you know, we've seen these things in supermarkets and everything like that. So retail, the very first retail barcode on a product was a packet of Wrigley's gum back in 1974. So back then they used a UPC or a universal product code or a 12 digit, it's the US 12 digit version of our 13 digit retail code. In 2017 in Belgium, GS1 started testing the GS1 data matrix and whether it could be suitable for retail for a retail barcode. You know, a handful of large supermarket chains moved their hardware and software to accept this new code as part of a pilot project. So the advantage of the GS1 data matrix is that it can handle far more characters than a standard 13-digit uh, 1D code. So in addition to the GTIN, the data matrix code identifies batch lot numbers for traceability, used by dates, you know, loads more. This allows supermarkets to use the same code across all its supply chain and optimize stock management. It also being able to put the traceability down to individual products. If ever there's a need for a recall, you can trace not just the, the pallet like you had beforehand, because you couldn't put a 1D, um, a, a 1D GS1-128 onto a, onto a product, but you can now with these, include single box and product code. So you can trace it down to an individual product based on the fact that you could scan a product and it can give you exactly where that product's come from, where it's going to, everything. You know, it's it was a lot harder, now it's a lot easier. You know, where it's come from, where it's contained and where, what shelf it's on. So the more information that can be gained from the barcode for the retailer and the benefit of the consumer, the more information the consumers can get off, the more comfortable somebody's going to feel about purchasing a product if you have this kind of standard code. Of course, not everybody's set up to scan these sort of things. You know, it, you know, at the moment, you know, it's primarily you see, you know, big retailers using these things. You know, but what we would like to see eventually, you know, we'd like to see uh, some of the, uh, the, the smaller, you know, we'd like to see some of the smaller retailers using it, of course. But at the moment, this is where our, this is sort of where we're starting off. And I love the view of this. I love the fact that we can see this on produce and, you know, and, you know, and consumables. So it'd be good to see where this leads to in the future. So, you know, a lot of information I'm giving here is both GS1 healthcare data matrix guidelines. So this is all from an actual guidelines book. So this is also known as the TGA Health and Safety Regulations Guidebook for Better Healthcare. So a version uh, for use of data matrix codes for, med for medicines and traceability. So this is all part of a big guidelines book from GS1 and all these images and everything are from this. So there's a global acceptance of using GS1 data matrix codes in healthcare. It has created a worldwide standard that allows for, e use of, for ease of transport, sorting and traceability of medications within the healthcare system. And this is just in with us, within Australia. This is worldwide. So we can develop medications here in Australia, put the appropriate application identifiers into a GS1 data matrix code, and then that product can be shipped around the world. You know, and, and people can pick up GTIN's batch lots used by serial numbers, et cetera, you know, global product identification. Unlike previously, Australia primarily used what we called a GTIN or EAN13. US would use a UPC, which is a completely different code. So what could be picked up in our supermarkets may not be picked up overseas in their supermarkets. So this is a global code. So one key area that was understood and has come into agreement that everyone uses the GS1 data matrix code and not the GS1 QR code to identify therapeutic goods. So this will allow common standards and compatibility worldwide. Everybody's agreed to this one code. So with a lot of other standard pictograms and codes, as you can see here on this design, you know, which I could go into all sorts of things about medical and healthcare and this state, uh, this code. Um, but uh, that's a lot more information. If you want to contact me, you can talk to me about this. But this, you can fit a lot more in a GS1 data matrix than uh, the older 1D codes. The GS1 data matrix codes can be used within healthcare systems for patient information, medicines administered, administered, track and trace surgical and medical tools, and full asset management and information. You, know, you can find things, you, know, you can relay more information across in a, in a GS1 data matrix code, and they can fit onto really small little information areas, as we can see right here. You know, 
it's such an easier type of code and information that you can get across. So now we get on to transport and logistics. This is the big one. So this is the one where uh, that we that the primary usage of GS1 data matrix for the application identifiers to remove those older 1D codes or keep them in there, but give the opportunity for more information to be put about the product. So whilst GS1 data matrix can be used over an entire supply chain management from raw materials manufacturing to shipped goods, I'm going to concentrate on one area here that is use, used for the GS1 data matrix for transport and, and logistics. So whilst we've had GS1 128 SSC CL serial shipper container codes for a very long time, the GS1 data matrix code can be implemented to increase the amount of information that can be collected by the warehouse sending the product, the trucking, the trucking company collecting the product, the distribution facility collecting the product, the local hub breaking down the products, and the courier delivering the product to the store. And as we've seen with certain big chain supermarkets, the product actually being sold in the store. So as we've seen, these codes are extremely versatile. So I've spoken about application identifiers. These can be used to identify product codes or GTNs, location of origin by unique codes, postcodes, location distribution center by unique postcodes, date of manufacturing, batch lot numbers used by data, et cetera, et cetera. These codes can be allowed for traceability across all areas and transport companies can use these application identifiers to release, relay information through EDI or electronic data interchange systems to give all parties involved the transportation of the goods up to date information and location of goods. So up to date information, that is the key part. So in the past to fit that amount of information into a 1D code that was just way too complex and large for to print, you know, for high visibility and everything like that, efficient automated scanning, you could not fit that much, this much information. So that either have to split it up into multiple barcodes, like you can see here on the, in the, in the previous types of labels in a 2D code, like the GS1 data matrix, you can fit all that information, all that complex information into one code about a quarter of the size of a single GS1 data matrix, uh, sorry, GS1 128. So implementation. So Toshiba's entire range of label printers can print GS1 data matrix codes, which machine depends on what sort of industry and requirements you have. Transport and logistics and used for any of our machines for both thermal transfer using ribbon or thermal direct no ribbon. The most common shipping labels and thermal direct labels would utilize our BV400D series. thermal direct desktop models or for ex4d2s it's our industrial thermal direct model but because a transport label only needs to last a small amount of time thermal direct printing is just sufficient in creating these type of labels but all our four inch and up machines can do thermal direct printing as well our six inch and eight inch machines could be used for larger pallet shipping or drum labels or single crates in the case for medical and retail and food, manufacturing using, uh, using uh, ribbon and also uh, needing a thermal transfer printer you know, is beneficial. For healthcare that require chemicals to be heat resistant for cleaning purposes, for all sorts of things, you know, you'd want to use a full resin ribbon. And also synthetic labels would need to be used for, you know, for abrasive resistance and heat resistance and chemical resistance. You know, food or, you know, retail, depending on the environment, the product is being displayed. Large supermarket chains in Australia are now using GS1 data matrix codes for their fresh produce and being stored in cold, wet environments. The label would definitely need to be synthetic and the, re the, the ribbon would need at least to be abrasive resistance due to handling. So resin ribbons would still be recommended, but would need to have a chemical heat resistance that medical devices would probably need. So you, you probably would need something uh, resin, but you would definitely need a high chemical heat resistance if it was medical. So once you have an idea about what your requirements are, please feel free to contact us more at Toshiba to discuss more about your needs. So software. I've always recommended Seagull Scientific's Bartender. It has a lot of built-in templates and designs can be used to pretty much every type of barcode, including the GS1 data matrix, 
with every Toshiba becomes free, a copy of Bartender Ultralight. You know, it might be more of what she sees, what you get type of version, but because it can do basic serial numbers, you can use SSC transport labels. Reasons to upgrade would include professional version, you know, in case you wanted, you know, to have databasing, ability to use waste scales, food production, you know, complex use by dates, RFID, transport labeling, touchless technology, more. So, you know, but let's first rewind. Before you can even start printing your GS1 data matrix barcodes, you would also need to go to the GS1. You just need to also become a GS1 Australia member. So if you go to gs1au.org and click on the join GS1 orange button on the top of the right uh, hand of the screen, you are taking the steps in the right direction. I'll give a link to the uh, to the website uh, further along. So you'll need to be given an allotment of range of numbers you can use for your GTINs and then implement them into a single product code, box code, shipper code, et cetera. And if you are using only the numbers provided by GS1 Australia, then you won't fall into the trap of accidentally using someone else's numbers or incorrect numbers like 93, the first two numbers for any Australian GTIN. So once you have your barcode numbers, you can put them on into Bartender and print your GS1 data matrix barcodes as well as a huge range of other things. So if you're wondering what version you have, you know, just contact us to find out more. So other things, other software is things like EDI systems, transport and logistics systems, warehouse management systems. Uh, you'd have to talk to your local transport courier companies. Um, but we can always work alongside with those companies to make sure we find the correct software and hardware suitable for your needs. So this video, you can see how easy it is to create your own GS1 data matrix code. You can just click on that. I've got it set here because I've used them before, but if you click on just more barcodes, you can click on this and look at general purpose or by symbology. You can just look at, okay, type, and there's the GS1 data matrix. You can select it. And this is just showing you how to place it into the into the label. You can use this to move the uh, the human readable from underneath. Just double click on the barcode. We want to go up to symbology and size up the top. And we're just going to show, I'm just going to quickly show you how easy it is to select those application identifiers that I told you about. So Bartender has a wizard for everything, which really shows you how to select the correct application identifier for you. So we talked about that 01, that G10, you know, that, that you put your 13 digit code in, it creates the 14 digit code. It has a one at the start or a zero at the start. We're just going to do embedded details. So we'll keep that zero. We'll just keep that zero at the start. Then we'll just put in our nine three for our country code, and then one two three four five six seven eight nine zero, and of course seven becomes the check digit. If we put in one at the start for it's a pallet of goods, it'll change that to a four, that check digit to a four, and zero will become a seven. So that's an individual product versus a pallet of products. And if I want to add some more, we're going to go and find things like batch or lot numbers. And I can put in whatever I want to put in. Again, database field or embedded num embedded data just means I'm hand putting this information in. We're just going to leave it as ABC123. I want to add one more into this. I'm just going to show you the details of going down and we're going to do in quantity. We're going to use by dates. We've got a count of items, number 30. Now, if I come down here, we've also got a few others in like, you know, amount of storage we've got. And I'm just want to come all the way down to 37, which is count of trade item numbers. That's individual products within the palette. But you can see we've got a lot of different types of application identifiers, including in-house ones as well. All right, next, so we're going to count items. And we're just going to do it again by embedded data. And we can use however many characters we want. So I'm just saying this 30 in here. And no, I don't want to add any more. And we're finishing and you can see we've got our g10 the number put in a batch and lot number then also our counting of items and you can see it also puts in as application identifiers as well as a term a terminator which is that function one character we talked about before all right so you can see that's how easy it is to create a uh, a gs1 data matrix code we can size it as big and as small as we want to put it onto the label and we can just change the size of the text underneath. 
The other thing we can do, and this is also main, a lot used in um, in healthcare, they tend to put all the different uh, application, uh, application identifiers on single individual lines. So the way to do that, you can come in here and just line break after each application identifier, and you can see, and it does like that, and we can change the position and style of it. And it's really that easy. It really is that easy to uh, to change to creating a GS1 data matrix code for shipping or item um, uh, labeling. So where to find more information? Of course, previously said, just go to the GS1AU.org website. You know, you can join, you can look up information on 2D codes, you can read information on their standards. They offer a lot, a lot of services. So, you know, you can talk to them or and find out more information on on gs1 data matrix but click on that orange button sign up get your codes and then the next thing you can do is contact us at toshiba you know we can talk about a sig scientific bartender our printer range our ribbon range your needs your software your hardware all the needs that you need uh, for printing gs1 data matrix it's very simple and easy to get yourself compliant with as long as you stick to the industry standards you can always find the best systems available for, for you Thank you for joining me today.